Hello everybody. Hello. Hi Nancy. Hi Prof. Hi Lisa. Good afternoon. Hello, how are you? Very good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited that uh, you are all able to join us today uh, for this particular meeting. Uh, we have many people actually, about 100 uh, people registered to join us today. Uh, again, I uh, have the pleasure of welcoming you to this webinar today. It's one of the uh, many seminar meetings that we do organize. Uh, here at the uh, East Africa Institute uh, of the Aga Khan University. Now, the East African Institute is a research and policy dialogue uh, platform for the Aga Khan University, established to uh, provide stakeholders with a platform to engage on issues that emerge and uh, you know, other issues of uh, importance to uh, development locally and in the region. And that's why we felt like today was a good day to also organize uh, something around the blue economy, because this is one of the um, topics that is actually uh, of concern in many policy arenas. Now, um, I think you both uh, actively participated in the uh, Sustainable Blue Economy Conference that happened in uh, 2018 and uh, which resulted in the Nairobi Statement of Intent on advancing a sustainable blue economy, which had a raft of uh, recommendations coming out, lots of money being committed uh, to uh, you know, different commitments, and uh, you know, cutting across countries and also cutting across sectors of the uh, blue economy. Now, Canada, Kenya, and the World Wide Fund for Nature, WWF, are some of the countries and organizations that committed to a significant amount of activities to invest in. Uh, some of them, of course, costing monies and others uh, not necessarily uh, uh, monies. And uh, all these were meant to be able to support countries in the different regions of the world to harness the potential in our seas and oceans, lakes, rivers, to be able to improve lives for all. And of course, the ability of them to leverage latest technologies, innovations, scientific innovations, and so on, to build uh, their prosperity, while of course, conserving uh, the futures, uh, future water, uh, or rather waters for the future generations. Now, to be able to help us uh, deal with, uh, you know, issues that are emerging around, uh, you know, understanding what progress has been made, uh, we felt that we should come up with this kind of a forum so that we are able to, at the end of the day, understand the extent to which the outcomes from that important global conference. I joined the and then it went off. This is a dilemma. Can you mute people, please? Uh, so that you know, we can be able to understand what has happened. What have governments uh, done in responding to some of those commitments? And also, this also gives us a platform to reflect on the way forward, uh, particularly in the in the view that um, you know the world is now uh, confronted with the COVID pandemic, which we might alter the way in which countries may have planned to deal with some of these things uh, going forward. So my dear audience, um, to help us understand these issues, we are glad to uh, inform you that uh, we have a panel before you, which is going to uh, help us sort this out. We have the three key panelists. Uh, Cosmas is yet to join us, but we hope you can be able to uh, log in in the course of the discussions. 
So uh, the first on the list is uh, Her Excellency Lisa Stradlebaum. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Lisa. Uh, the Canada's High Commissioner to Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, and also the Ambassador to Somalia and Burundi. And she's also Canada's permanent representative to the United Nations in Nairobi. Uh, then we have Professor Michelle Ntiba, who is the Principal Secretary, the State Department of Fisheries, Aquaculture, and the Blue Economy at the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, and Fisheries. And thirdly, we also have Nancy Vega. Hello, Nancy. And uh, Nancy is the Policy, Research, and Innovations Manager at the World Wide Fund for Nature, WWF, based here in Nairobi. So as you can see, we have uh, people who are really uh, you know, involved in, in the blue economy affairs uh, you know, in different um, uh, perspectives. But when Cosmas joins, we shall be glad to uh, introduce him to us. Now, uh, the way we've organized this webinar is that the public will not be able to post questions directly to the panelists. However, they will be sending us questions by email, which we shall then be able to read to the panelists to be able to uh, respond uh, to them. So I would like to start by inviting um, Her Excellency Lisa. Stadelbauer to be able to respond to the following. Um, Canada is deeply committed to the blue economy agenda. And I think we all know that Canada has the largest coastline in the world, if I'm not wrong, uh, maybe you'll be able to clarify that. And considering not only its activities at home in Canada, but also uh, co-sponsoring the Global Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in 2018, but also because of the significant level of commitment and promises it made uh, at the Sustainable Blue Economy Forum. And a lot of these are online in, the, in what we call the Nairobi Statement of Intent. How many of these commitments, Your Excellency, have been realized so far? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to join this conversation. Um, I arrived in Kenya in October 2018, so one of the very first things that I jumped into uh, was this conference, and so it will always have a bit of a, a soft spot in my heart um, getting up to speed on these issues. And um, I thought what I would do actually is talk a little bit about why oceans matter to Canada, why this issue was important to us, um, and then a little bit about what we're doing internationally. Although, to be honest, that's not so much my focus here. Um, I want to spend more time talking about what we're doing in Kenya uh, to help promote the blue economy agenda uh, in Kenya. And so why is water important in the ocean? It's important to Canada. As you mentioned, we do have the longest coastline in the world. We have about 2.76 million square kilometers of ocean. Uh, we border three oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Arctic. And we hold 20% of the world's freshwater resources through inland lakes, including the Great Lakes water system. Um, these waters drive a marine economy, and our marine economy, so the blue economy in Canada, supports about 350,000 jobs and contributes close to $35 billion Canadian to our country's GDP. And so we thought it was important to share our expertise and our knowledge about how we have used um, the blue economy to help promote our own um, economic gains. But for us, it was always not just about the blue economy, but about the sustainable blue economy. And so how do you um, use the resources that the oceans provide in ways that are sustainable for generations to come? In 2016, our Prime Minister launched a $1.5 billion National Oceans Protection Plan. And that was really the largest um, investment that the Government of Canada had ever made into the oceans and coasts and waterways, um, working with our Indigenous communities and our coastal communities with really protection and safeguards and sustainability at the heart of that plan. We had a goal to protect 10% of our oceans by 2020. And in fact, we're ahead of that deadline. We reached about 14% by, by August 2019. And now we're working towards 30% of our oceans being protected territory by 2030. 
Um, another reason why this issue is so important to Canada is that we have something called a feminist international assistance policy and a feminist foreign policy and a proud feminist prime minister. And what that means is that we're putting women and girls at the heart of everything that we do. Uh, we firmly believe that you can't succeed as a country, as a nation, as a world, if you're leaving half the population behind. And when you look at the blue economy, particularly uh, fisheries and agriculture, women play a really important role in that value chain. They make up 47% of the 120 million people worldwide who earn money directly from fishing and processing. And in the global south, women constitute over 85% of the workers in industrial processing, equipment maintenance, trading, and retail of fresh fish. So it's really important if we're looking at that aspect of the blue economy, you have to include women. Um, now, for us, um, making the youth as well part of the development um, a development agenda was also very important, especially when you look at Kenya with the young population here. And I'll talk a little bit more later about how we really have targeted that population because I think it's very, very important. Now what we're doing internationally, um, our political engagement really started um, with our G7 presidency in Charlevoix uh, in 2018. And um, we had as a key part of that G7 agenda, uh, the Charlevoix blueprint for healthy oceans, seas and resilient coastal communities. Um, G7 leaders agreed at that time the need to work together on important areas including resilient coasts and coastal communities, ocean knowledge, science, data, sustainable oceans and fisheries, and in particular tackling IUU fishing which is illegal, underreported and unregulated fishing. Um, and also a key focus on ocean plastic waste and marine litter. We had an outreach session with uh, the G7, but then as is G7 traditions, we invited some people to join in the conversation. And with that conversation, we included Kenya, Rwanda, Senegal, Seychelles, and South Africa. And um, I think that really is where that partnership between my prime minister and your president cemented around this issue of the sustainable blue economy. Um, at that summit, we launched our Oceans Plastics Charter to eradicate plastic pollution. And today, 26 other countries have endorsed that charter, and we continue to push for that charter to, to be endorsed by other countries. Uh, Canada hosted the G7 Environment, Oceans and Energy Ministers in Halifax, Nova Scotia in September 2018. And our announcements at that time included um, $11.6 million to combat illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing throughout the world and $100 million to address marine litter. Those are just some of the things that we're doing internationally to continue on with the momentum. Um, but now turning to, to Kenya, which I think is probably more interesting for all of you. Um, after the Blue Economy Conference, we sat down at the High Commission and tried to figure out what it was we were going to do to keep that momentum moving forward. And I had the sense that, you know, we had gotten the country kind of excited about this concept of the blue economy and how it was going to be a game changer for the economy of Kenya and there's going to be all these jobs, money, but I wasn't convinced that people knew what we meant when we talked about the blue economy beyond fishing. And when you think about the blue economy, it is so much more than just fishing. It's tourism, it's transportation, it's shipping, it's um, wave science, it's ocean science. Um, incredibly, I cut a number of fields um, with interesting jobs, the jobs of the future really for a lot of coastal Kenyans and even those living along the lakes as well. <clears throat> So what we did um, to start with is we funded three um, workshops partnering with UN Habitat and the Youth Congress. We did one in Nairobi, one in Kisumu, and one in Mombasa. And we brought together private sector, we brought together local government to not to have a job fair, but to talk about jobs. What were the jobs in the blue economy for these kids in these communities? What do the jobs look like? And what kind of skills did you need to get there? Uh, so it was really a, a, a workshop focused on job training and skills training and just understanding better what we need when we talk about jobs in the blue economy. We've also um, done a fact finding, fact finding study to better understand um, youth in the blue economy. And we looked at Kenya, um, a bit, sorry, sorry, we looked at Mombasa, Kisumu, Homa Bay, and Kalifi. And the result of that is that we are now beginning to work on two big projects. The workshops were small projects that kind of whetted our appetite to see if there was a, an interest. And now we see there very much is an interest and a need. And so we're looking at using our larger development project um, in two particular areas. 
One um, is that we currently have a project with uh, the TVETs in Kenya. So every single TVET in Kenya, Technical and Vocational Training College in Kenya, is partnered with a college in Canada. And those colleges in Canada are helping with curriculum design, curriculum development, skills training, there's a procurement element to it. And what we're looking at for the next phase of that project is bringing in a blue economy element to it to get some of the TVETs in Kenya focusing on some of these blue economy uh, job opportunities. And then the second thing that we're doing is, um, again, because our focus is on women and girls uh, in our development project, we're looking at business development for women in the blue economy sector. Now, these projects are both in very early days, and so I can't uh, give you the scoop on the money and the partners and all that good stuff. That will come in good time. But we're quite excited about um, the importance of this for Kenya and the impact that it will have um, for, for generations to come, really. If we can figure out how to better tap in, if we can help Kenyans figure out how to better tap in to the ocean and water resources that you have uh, for economic and skills development. Thank you. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for that uh, enlightenment. I mean, this is uh, very interesting to see what's going on already. I mean, I didn't imagine that, uh, you know, we already had uh, things like TVET uh, institutions already being uh, uh, linked to institutions in Canada. Um, let me listen to um, Professor McKenney. Um, Kenya also made significant commitments uh, during that conference. Um, actually, around 19 of them, if you count uh, down that list, uh, for implementation towards an inclusive and resilient blue economy. How many of these have been tackled so far? And what do you consider the biggest challenges in implementing those? And of course, what kind of solutions do you have um, against some of those uh, barriers? Prof. Um, Daktari, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, for inviting me to be part of this. In fact, I was wondering what uh, uh, what uh, East African Institute of Aga Khan University, and you know, we know the Aga Khan more of medical services and things like that. But now I know what this is all about. Thank you. First of all, to say that uh, after we held the 2018 conference. I think that conference and some very important uh, characteristics. We held this conference uh, uh, and supported it jointly with the government of Canada, with the uh, government of Japan and others. And this conference and special characteristics, and I think it will have those special characteristics uh, from that time into the future. It was to me and uh, to us, I think in Kenya and others are saying so, that the first gathering globally that brought a huge number of uh, participants from the world to discuss sustainable blue economy. Because what we see after this is that they are, they, are, they are sprung so many meetings in every part of the world discussing blue economy moving forward. And to us, we think that uh, we kind of rekindled uh, this kind of uh, uh, thinking around the world, and particularly for us in Africa. We call also out of this, uh, we are going to host, to co-host, with Portugal in Lisbon, the next uh, the, the, the UN 2020 Blue Economic Conference, and uh, a conference that was very important, particularly because I know it was going to uh, to launch a number a number of uh, initiatives worldwide, and particularly the 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 decade for action on um, blue economy development and also uh, it was going to be some kind of a launch band for the UN decade for ocean science. But I think as you know, COVID came and uh, 
is still hoping that uh, we are going to have this conference. In terms of uh, the commitments that were made at the conference, I think there are a number of things we need to note. That uh, one, you know, very many people made uh, commitments at this conference. And I think uh, Canada knows, we discussed this last year, that uh, there was a problem of, you know, uh, uh, following up on who made what promises and so on and so forth. And that uh, we thought that in the future, we should have those making, making commitments to make specific and time-bound commitments moving forward. Because we saw a lot of commitments were made, you know, in that uh, very big conference, but following the map became uh, an issue. And we were hoping that uh, the, the Lisbon conference was going to correct this. But uh, from our side as Kenya, I think we have achieved a lot. Achieved a lot in the sense that, uh, that uh, we have uh, involved ourselves in quite a number of activities. For example, we worked with ourselves to host another conference on blue economy for the, for the Nyanza region, for the Lake Victoria region particularly to coincide with uh, the effort government is making to revive the Kisumu port. I think that was important. And also government put a lot of money in the years from 2018, last year, and this year moving forward, particularly for us to build the coastal infrastructure related to fisheries. You know, we deal with a lot of uh, fish landing sites uh, fishing ports, for example, you recall we 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 we, we, we gazetted the Liwatoni fishing port in Mombasa as our first fishing port to be able to to open up the ocean fisheries, uh, especially after Kenya ratified the Port State Measures Agreement in 2017 and where we want to fight IUU, illegal and reported and unregulated fishing. So we have an operation of fish port now in Mombasa. And the cue is this, if we license you as a country to fish in our EEZ, you can't go away anymore. You can't go away, you have to report it to a fish port and that's the importance of the effort we put uh, a lot of money to revive the Liwatoni fishing port. We have also put a mechanism to open up a second port in, Kilip, in, uh, in Shimoni. The Shimoni fishing port is underway to also be constructed. We have a number of uh, fish markets. We have trained uh, about 160 uh, fishermen uh, in ocean going capabilities moving forward. We wish to train 500 that's a hundred from each of the counties moving forward. And we also, working with IFAD, have launched a 15 billion Kenya shillings program to commercialize aquaculture in 15 counties in this country. We think these 15 counties with high aquaculture potential can become the nearest neighbor to spur growth of aquaculture in the other, in the other counties moving forward. And recently also, uh, 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 late last month, we also signed a financing agreement for a program targeting marine fisheries at the Kenya coast with the World Bank, a facility for 10 billion Kenya shares are moving forward. We think, we think uh, this is very important. Within the same period also, the five counties from the Kenya coast were given a grant of 2.5 billion by the EU. So I think so many things have happened you know, around ourselves moving forward. And um, I think that uh, we are on the right path. Uh, uh, I think the fisheries law is complete. The fisheries regulations are completed. So this has been work in progress. But I know also 
the other departments, the departments of shipping and maritime affairs. It's also a very big program, particularly to put very many candidates on, 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 on particularly cruise vessels uh, to work there. But I think I've had like this has been slightly slackened down because of COVID moving forward. And of course, the issues of tourism moving forward. We think in the future also that uh, we should be talking about bringing in the other departments like the Department of Petroleum, because we know we have some oil and gas in the sea. We will also be bringing in the uh, State Department of Mining, because we know we have some minerals in the sea. And also other departments, including sports and things like that. So these are some of the things uh, that uh, we are doing. Additionally, we are also putting a state-of-the-art Mariculture uh, uh, Center at the at, at Kuala because we think in the future we will need to mainstream farming in the sea. Uh, so, Dr. Ali, those are some of the things that uh, we are doing and we will continue to do. And also, I can the the, the ambassador of Canada. Remember when our president was in Canada last uh, that uh, uh, Canada uh, agreed to work with Kenya to construct a marine, a marine aquarium at the Kenya coast. We have been planning to do this. We were going there in April. There was some slackening when Canada was in uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, you know, they were voting and things like that. We were going there in April and COVID, <laughs> COVID stopped all these activities. So I wish to, think that this is a very good opportunity for us to talk these things. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, let me now turn to Nancy. Um, WWF is one of those that made uh, commitments, particularly around uh, technical assistance and capacity building to countries, mainly for evaluation and ocean resource uh, assessment uh, capacity. To what extent uh, have you succeeded in this, Nancy? Um, and then just mention also generally about uh, what uh, WWF is doing in the blue economy uh, circles as uh, an environmental organization. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tari, and good afternoon to you all. Unfortunately, my bandwidth is a bit low, so I'm not able to use my video, but I'll switch to my phone at some point, maybe when I'm done with my short presentation. If you allow me, uh, I think I'll just share my screen briefly uh, so that it can guide my small presentation. I don't know whether I, can you see my screen? Not yet. Can you see it now? Yes. yes okay. Yeah, so I'll be very brief, although I have 50 slides, but I will use five of them. Uh, and I want us to just think briefly about the statistics that we have, uh, even as WWF, uh, because we say WWF is a science-based organization, and therefore we work a lot with statistics. So without going into the sustainable blue economy, which has been uh, presented quite well, in terms of statistics, we say that oceans are the seventh largest economy. And this is a study that was done by WWF in 2015. Uh, and at that time, which is almost five years ago, we were talking of $24 trillion. And the goods and services such as food at $2.5 trillion. And when we look at these figures, they may look big, uh, but they do not actually include other ecosystem services like oil or wind and the ocean's role in climate regulation. And when we go down to Africa and our maritime, it actually has reached about 1, mil, 1 trillion USD uh, annual value. Now, looking at that and looking at what is happening to these resources, I think we are saying that almost two thirds of our resources are fully exploited in terms of wild fisheries, uh, not too much benefit to Africa or to the Eastern African region. And yet the diversity has slumped from 1970 to 2010 by almost 39%. And when we look at uh, the commitment also of the African Union, 
uh, we are saying that uh, the blue economy is the new frontier of our renaissance. Coming a little back home to the Western Indian Ocean region, what has been valued, our ocean assets have been valued at about 333.8 billion uh, US dollars. And again, this figure is very conservative because it doesn't measure those other ecosystem services that we get. Coming to Kenya, I think it's only 4% of our national total GDP, maybe slightly higher. This was a study uh, a little earlier. Yet, uh, you'll find that our ocean economy is highly focused on tourism, which of course has suffered very much now if we look at uh, because of COVID. So that is the value. And this 24 trillion from the report again that was undertaken, a study undertaken by WWF, showing that 70% uh, of the annual value of the ocean is actually heavily dependent on the health of the ocean. Um, and for Africa, uh, if we were to just look at what is the gross marine product, just looking at the Western Indian Ocean only, that economy is at fourth uh, from South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, it comes uh, forth uh, on that. So quite a lot of resources that we have. And then we have the communities that we are talking about who have a huge wealth of knowledge and have lived in the seas uh, around water bodies for many, many years. Actually, we always say each water body has its owners. And these are the communities that have lived around these places for many years, um, managing and uh, in a good balance between themselves and nature. Of course, unfortunately, with our population, cultural changes, globalization of trade, then this balance is no longer there. A huge population, like the Eastern African region of about 20 million, all looking at the coastal resources. And unfortunately, we are still seeing that the poorest communities, like in Kenya from the last uh, census, I think are coastal communities. So those counties in the coast are still the poorest, even with this resource that we have. Uh, with about 62% living below uh, the poverty line. And if you look at basically what our developments, they have been more terrestrial. So we have actually exploited our terrestrial resources and the space that is currently remaining is that space, coastal, uh, marine, our water bodies, that is what is remaining. And we are therefore at a crossroad because we continue doing the things we are doing, uh, pollution, uh, like uh, Professor Antiba has mentioned, of exploiting the acidification and the warming up and the destroying of that habitat, it will means that actually the resource that we are looking at will no longer be able to support us. I'll not go into all the challenges because I think we know them, but what is clear is that the, those coastal and marine life is highly threatened uh, with a lot of coastal development, uh, leaving very few places for marine life to take refuge. And we are not saying development is not good, but development needs to also consider uh, the environment and the ecosystems. A number of challenges, uh, issues of mangrove uh, destruction, uh, a lot of devastating effect in terms of food security and coastal stability, and even the, the carbon storage that we have is also uh, heavily uh, compromised. But we still do have some time, I, I think, to make some uh, bend in that curve. It's not too late. We can still make real progress on solutions. And I think uh, the meeting that was held uh, in 2018, the Blue Economy Conference, this is the hope uh, and how we were looking at, you know, going forward. How, are we, how is Blue Economy going to impact on economies, on livelihoods of people? be able to do that for the current generations and still be available to do that for the future generations. So many opportunities. Uh, with governments embracing SDGs, I think listening to Professor Antiba, quite some work and the government's commitment to do that. But I think there is still some opportunities and actions that are still required to be done. Uh, and from uh, studies, again, by WWF, other scientists and other partners we are saying that by 2030, we actually, if we are to have some, uh, if they're not, the ocean resources are going to still provide for us, at least 30% need to be conserved and effectively managed. And, and when this happens, then we can get the proper biodiversity required, our food security and our livelihoods can also be secured. Uh, the participatory protection, and that's where communities come in. 
uh, I think there's someone, uh, a, a participant who has raised it, uh, that if you look at even the, uh, what we think about the oceans and the coastal communities and communities living, whether it's near Lake Trucana or near Lake Victoria, they are not the, the most well endowed in terms of their livelihoods. Yet they live near uh, resources that should be able to support that. And what is happening now is that there is no participatory protection. Either people look at this as a resource to hunt. In fact, we talk about hunting of fish as opposed to managing that resource for today and tomorrow and ensuring that uh, what we take today enables us to still go back uh, to that uh, space tomorrow. So beyond the economics uh, that, that we know, and looking at industrial fisheries, uh, for instance, in this region, we find that uh, from the statistics, the industrial fisheries produce more than six times the revenue of small scale fisheries. Yet the small scale fisheries, uh, a number, we, we get a number of about 250,000 fishers or fisher folk in the region. And some estimates uh, give, it, uh, give the number up to 500,000 across whether it's Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, and that region. So it means there is a lot of capacity if we are to engage those small scale fisheries, those communities to take care of the resource, but then also derive a, a livelihood from it. Um, so quite a lot of opportunities, but for the CSOs uh, where uh, we come from, then we find the, like the opportunity we have this, uh, this afternoon of convening stakeholders to influence and support reforms. I think that is some work that is cut out and which we actually need to invest in. The issue of building inclusive processes. We are saying we talk of inclusion. We talk about recognizing the roles of community. Coming from Kenya, you know, often I wonder, we have a lot, we put in a lot of effort to coffee. We put in a lot of effort to tea production. Where, what effort do we put in, you know, to the coastal communities and fisheries production? I don't think uh, that has been done uh, quite fairly. Uh, we also have a, a, a role as a CSO to support diversification of economic activities, expansion of value chains. Again, this is not uh, properly utilized, and I think it can take communities very, very far. And of course, supporting ecotourism practices and so on. And we also come from an opportunity where we can test various technologies, share the knowledge. We are not afraid to, fa to fail. So if this technology didn't work, what else works? what has worked in other parts of the world, how can we share that knowledge? I think as CSOs, we do have that great opportunity. Lobbying for incentive-based plans. As I have said, other areas, you'll find if it's under wildlife, communities say in the Masai Mara will benefit from the resources that come from the Mara Reserve. If it is a tea, uh, we invest a lot of that. We invest a lot in sugar uh, and mumias. You know, we keep investing in those areas. So we do need a, a, pro, a process where we also should get investments going into these uh, coastal communities or communities that live along the water bodies. Traditional knowledge systems that have worked in the past, but uh, we, we say we are committed. Our policies also indicate that we are committed to that, but we rarely see us moving them uh, to see how they can help us in the management of oceans and other water bodies. Influencing policy, and we work very closely uh, with government. We have worked with Professor Antiba uh, and people in the ministry just to look at how can we advocate for appropriate policies? How can we rally and lobby for inclusion? Uh, because it's vital to actually include communities in the, convers in the conversations that we are having, because it's the only way that whether it's the youth, the few indigenous peoples that are remaining and vulnerable members of the society, can also uh, prosper. So as CSOs, we have that uh, big role. So as I come to an end, so WWF nationally and globally, we have continued actually to strengthen partnerships with communities, with non-state actors. Uh, we have also uh, been working with key players to look at ways of dealing with plastic pollution, for instance, and have been calling for a legally binding agreement to eliminate the leakage of plastics into the ocean. And then, of course, the use of best practices and decision-making tools, like the strategic environmental assessments, marine spatial planning. I think most counties started working on spatial planning, but not much on marine spatial planning. So we are working on that uh, community-based natural resources management. And of course, a lot of research. And our hope is that the publications that are done 
by WWF and many other partners, science, science partners, would be able to enable us uh, to move forward. So quite uh, a lot, just trying to put a value to the ocean assets, uh, trying to put a value to the water assets that we have, uh, and also looking at the blue economy finance principles, just to see how that can inform investment and development. In coastal Kenya for WWF Kenya, I think working with uh, the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Program, uh, we are looking at uh, enhancing opportunities for nature-based enterprises, a project like Mikoko Pamoja, trying to see how do we expand that carbon uh, trading uh, to Vanga and Lamu. We just finalized a study uh, on mangroves in Lamu, looking at fisheries value chain, uh, and also ensuring that we are also looking at the ecosystem because uh, sustainable production will only be based on an ecosystem that is also sound. Working with communities again on what we call VLSAs, in, uh, those are village um, loans and savings. We are saying most parts of this country uh, have developed from cooperatives. Central Kenya, I think, developed from tea and coffee cooperatives, uh, milk cooperatives, and so on, the dairy board. Uh, but for coastal region, how do we move that so that we have proper cooperatives that can move them to the next level? I've talked about uh, coastal zone and marine spatial planning uh, supporting Kilifi and Kuala counties. And we are also do, uh, committed to sharing knowledge uh, more eff effectively to actually drive institutional collaboration. But there are some gaps and I'll not go into all the policy gaps, but when it comes to communities and their engagement, I think as a country, we do need to finalize on our blue economy strategy so that uh, state and non-state actors see how we engage. Look at climate change because it's going to really impact on our resources. Uh, invest in tourism infrastructure. I think we've seen what COVID has done to tourism that is completely you know, based on tourists coming from abroad. So we probably need to look at that and see what that means in terms of building uh, resilience. Post-COVID, we have to diversify. Uh, we have to build resilience. There has to be value addition. Importantly, I think in these days of technology, we see more reason why we need technology-driven livelihoods, conservation and value addition, uh, well-managed protected areas. And uh, I think uh, one of the uh, participants raised the issue of we are not seeing young people actually engaging. None of them actually applied for a course in marine science and so on. And we are saying probably we haven't shown that this is the future of Kenya. This is where we have uh, uh, the resources that are terrestrial. I think we have almost spent all of them. So the frontier that remains for us as a country and as a region is the Blue Seas. So uh, we probably need to engage in that and develop capacities for that. And I'll finalize by saying that uh, that economic future, the Blue Economy, Cannot, cannot actually survive if we do not protect and restore the ecosystems. And that's work that WWF and partners are committed uh, to continue undertaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, I think we should uh, lobby the Zoom uh, company to put something clap for this. <laughs> so that we, you know, instead of uh, I've just let you go like that after a very uh, captivating uh, uh, presentation. Now, I will start by asking each of the panelists one question which I think from my view uh, has not been clearly um, um, elaborated. And then I will take a round of questions from the audience. I know that the audience is pouring in some questions through the chat but uh, we had asked them to send by email. So I will only present those that are coming in by email and those that are coming in by the chat, maybe the, the panelists can uh, respond to them at their leisure. So um, my question to um, Her Excellency um, is that in one of the commitments that Canada made, uh, they committed to lead in the development of a knowledge hub, uh, which would serve as a platform for sharing data, best practices, and uh, you know innovations in sustainable fisheries management globally. Uh, to what extent has that happened, Lisa? And uh, in what 
in terms of locating this particular knowledge hub, where would that be? Would that be in Canada? Would that be somewhere in Africa? Lisa? <laughs> Sure, I know the particular commitment that you're talking about, but I can tell you that we have um, in Canada a number of sector-based hubs um, across the country, and one of them is on um, fishes and fisheries and oceans. And so what it does is it brings in um, expertise from all across the country. And, you know, we have, I mentioned earlier, we have three oceans, east coast, west coast, and the north. So bringing in expertise... Um, from all of those regions, expertise from our, our water folks around the Great Lakes to make sure that we're sharing best practices around ocean science and around um, uh, um, green technology, around cutting edge technology. One of the interesting things that they're looking at, I know, is something called um, tidal power. So how do you harness the power of incoming and outgoing tides? Or wave science, how do you, how do you harness the power of waves um, for, green, for green and renewable technology? Certainly those hubs in Canada would be very, very, very well connected elsewhere in the world. And so um, if there are particular um, uh, elements within the Icon University that want to connect into that hub, I can certainly make that happen and make those connections. Okay. Um, and to the PS, uh, there is an element whereby Kenya commits itself to really deal with the issue of plastic waste management, uh, maritime safety and security, education and training, ETC. And if you look at all this, they cut across uh, mandates in different ministries and departments of government. To what extent uh, is that collaboration happening uh, across the government departments in order to achieve that? And the second question, again, Prof, that uh, you need to deal with and has been alluded to by Nancy, is when you look at the recent selection, there were no applications by candidates to the uh, BSc Oceanography, for example, and Marine Studies across. Is it because the students are ignorant? Uh, their teachers are not aware of these kind of things to mentor them, or rather to guide them into selecting these kind of courses? Prof. I think um, I think Dr. What you're asking is uh, how do we coordinate such a diverse, such a diverse, you know, uh, economy where so many, so many departments and what have you are involved. I think that's what you're asking me to do. Mm -hmm. But of course, this department has the coordination role for blue economy with the other departments. Just remember that uh, I know it's like uh, everything and anybody is in blue economy. That's why I, I liked the conference in Nairobi in 2018 because you know water economies are not like land economies. Land economies, all of us can see. It is easy to see when plants have diseases. It is easy to see when cows are in problems and so on and so forth. But you see, when you are talking about water economies, then you have, first of all, the first problem that uh, you and I spend all our time on land. We sleep and wake up on land that uh, we make decisions for water economies very far away from them in our capitals and so on and so forth. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is how government is structured with various parts of, of what blue economy is located in different departments and institutions. And I think we said we, we, we need uh, a blue economy strategy in this country. We are in the process of developing an integrated blue economy policy where we bring in all these departments so that each one of them knows the role they have to play while in coordination because we can't break them that easily. And I think that's the role of this department. For example, we are now preparing 
uh, to develop our marine spatial plan. I want to invite WWF to join us in this process because we can do piecemeal uh, marine spatial plans moving forward. So we want to do a comprehensive marine spatial plan for Kenya. We have already uh, begun that and we have already put an entire government committee in this. And I intended to use this as a launch pad to create a coordination mechanism where everybody is involved. This is very important. You have to look for where the other departments understand easily and they can be able to, to put their efforts and the resources there. But also remember when, the, when our president signed the fisheries law in 2016, he established a blue economy standing committee. And this committee has been very active some of the issues that I talked about, which we have achieved in the past, is to try and bring everybody together through this committee. Find out areas that require fast tracking. Find out areas where there is a deadlock and unlock all those things. So we found the Blue Economy Committee, where I sit, uh, very useful moving forward. So the whole issue of coordination is complex. And I think all of you know that uh, when we agree to uh, coordinate, to be harmonized, it is very easy at the table. But the moment we divert to our own areas, then it becomes a whole complex of things. You, you, you asked about uh, uh, plastics. I think this is coordinated by, by our, our Ministry of Environment and let me say this, for the first time, I have seen a Ministry of Environment which understands that aquatic environments are very critical and we cannot work at cross purpose uh, with the Ministry of Environment. Remember recently, there was a whole serialization of uh, pollution in Lake Victoria. Yeah, you, see, you see what I mean? Now, the competence for dealing with this issue, apart from the law, is with our Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, a state a corporation in this department, which has got the competence to do research in all our waters. So I think that's why we need to have a coordination mechanism that works. In terms of courses, I think it's around the same thing that I've uh, talked about, that very few people understand what blue economy is and very few people ask equations when i'm getting to it then what and this is why in the last uh, one year we'll be talking very seriously about the entire world becoming ocean and blue space literate and this is very critical we don't have to wait until one has gone to the university to choose a course or not to choose a course. We need to get to younger people in our education system so they grow understanding what blue economy is and the potentials that are there. I think this is something we need to do. I know at the IOC level, we have started a system of uh, 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 ocean, uh, ocean uh, academies and uh, Kenya hosts one of those uh, uh, ocean teacher academy programs at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute and I've been talking with the director that we also need to see younger people getting into our ships getting the experience of being at sea so that they are able to choose careers in the future that lead them to the sea. I became a marine biologist because I was taken to a field course in Mombasa. And when we got into a small boat, that's when my mind opened up, I would like to do this. So if we do not bring young people to understand what it entails, they will remain like you, who has never been to swim, because the first thing when you meet water, you start planning in your mind, the wheels in your mind start turning. You know, one, you think it is insecure, you think you are going to drown, you think all these things. 
So not very many people want to do it. But for us, I don't think we are short of these people. I remember a few years ago, Kenya and the highest number of trained uh, aquatic uh, uh, scientists. And I'm glad I participated in that uh, from the University of Nairobi and the other universities took up these courses. I think it's a culture of now with which has changed the young people's minds. We need to bring them back. We need ocean and aquatic uh, uh, science literacy in all our school systems. And everybody who is there needs to be active. Otherwise, you see it remain out there, very far away from people. Thank you, Prof. Uh, now, my last question goes to Nancy, and actually it's in two parts. Um, can you elaborate the, from your experience uh, the role of the private sector in the blue economy uh, initiatives, and particularly if there's any partnership that brings together the private sector, the academia, the NGOs, and so on. And then the second part of the question is, is WWF uh, part of the global compact? And uh, if so, uh, how is their role in there? Uh, you know, when it comes to implementing blue economy related initiatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daktari. I don't know, I also have a colleague here called Edward Kimakwa, who is our oceans expert, so if I cannot respond comprehensively, he, support, he will support me, but he, I can see he's also responding on chat. Uh, so in terms of a private sector partnership, I think increasingly for any sustainable activity, be it in conservation, be it in livelihood improvement, if the private sector is not engaged, then we cannot sustain actions. So as a, uh, civil society organizations, we can start small activities, but they cannot be sustained or scaled up unless we have the private sector. So I think for WWF uh, and the partners we work with, this is something that uh, we embrace. Currently, we have some activities, you know, just looking at, for instance, cooling systems and cooling solutions uh, <clears throat> for fisheries value addition uh, for fisheries and this cannot be done by a CSO or even government uh, on its own but we do need that business angle to be able to sustain those uh, actions so uh, this is important and I think increasingly uh, we are having a, we are having partners coming on board uh, whether it's in renewable energy uh, whether it is in a, a, in marketing and so on and this is what is going to sustain any any action. So for the blue economy, it is actually a pot, a melting pot, as the prof has said, for everyone. So everyone has a role to play in it and for its sustainability. And I want to stop uh, at that. So uh, WWF Kenya is a part of the global impact. And I think what we are mainly doing from a, a global level to the local level, uh, our engagement in terms of providing the research and the science are uh, to drive this is something that we have continued to do and continue to do going forward. But we, we are also looking at uh, supporting the development of the blue economy frameworks. Uh, so the principles of blue economy and the sustainable blue economy finance mechanisms so that uh, there are resources uh, that go into the blue economy and there are principles and a framework that can actually guide this. So that's what as WWF we are currently engaged in. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll now go to uh, questions that are coming okay, in. Can I, can I, Dr. Tali, talk about this question of the role of private sector? Mm -hmm. Yes, Bob. I just wanted to let you know that um, last year, the president asked that specific question. Why is it that we have under a fishery where we see people, we see local people, we see private companies and so on and so forth. And for example, to give, um, to give the case for Lake Victoria, where at one time we had uh, about 18 fish processing companies when the, when the fishery in that lake was, uh, was, was booming. And then around the year 
2000, uh, from 1998, when the EU, due to phytosanitary issues, uh, closed the market for that fishery. We saw uh, overnight all those companies closing down and then disappearing either to Uganda or to Tanzania moving forward. And that's why the president last last year, why don't we have an institution specifically to work with the private sector to build fisheries businesses that are known, that are sustainable, that are working with government, because this is where we are going to grow. Uh, this is where we are going to grow. Uh, this is where we are going to grow business, businesses. This is where we are going to grow wealth and things like that moving forward. And to say that uh, we have, in response to that, Kenya has established a new parastoto called the Kenya Fishing Industries Corporation, whose main purpose will be to work with private sector to grow fisheries related businesses in this sector. And I think this is important and we should be able to do the same with all the other areas of blue economy. It is very difficult, for example, to tackle the sea. It will be very difficult for Kenya to develop you know, oil and gas industries in the sea without a private sector. It will be very difficult to do mining in the sea without private sector participation moving forward. So I wanted to mention that, and we want to see how this model is going to work so that we can do the same for all the other subsectors of the blue economy. Thank you very much. Now, Prof, now that you are still at it, let me give you a question from uh, Dr. Mikene Dione from Dakar, who would like to know, um, his question reads, what are the trade-offs in terms of environmental sustainability and livelihoods posed by multiple projects aiming to exploit ocean and coastal resources in Kenya? How can the conflicting priorities posed by those trade-offs be addressed? And uh, the second part of this question, which you can also take on, is, is Kenya participating in a large regional effort for the sustainable development of the Western Indian Ocean? If so, how? Yeah, um, let me say this. And I think that question has a lot of uh, interconnectivity. Aquatic ecosystems, whether they are lakes, they are rivers, or whatever they are, oceans. I think the first point all of us need to note is that they are living ecosystems. If we miss that point, then, then <laughs> the, rest, the rest is finished. The rest is finished because in those aquatic ecosystems, living ecosystems, they are living aquatic resources and they are associated life webs and food chains and food webs. Now the moment we, we pollute or damage these ecosystems, all that wealth related to them is finished. That's why for a government, the first priority is to ensure the stability of living marine and freshwater ecosystems. That's why we have the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute to be able to do research there, to be able to warn us what is going on. If we don't do it, the other uh, resource exploitation which are non-living uh, aquatic water resources, things like oil and gas, things like mining, and so on. These can be done in dead seas. They can be done, they can be practiced in dead lakes. We can ride ships in dead waters. But I think the first priority is to protect the health integrity of these ecosystems. 
and that's why you see with the with the with the Ministry of Environment, we are working so hard to ensure that the integrity uh, in terms of health of these ecosystems is assured moving forward. I think to me that is critical, and anybody thinking to go and invest in the sea must take this as the first point to put in mind. It is also about linking the activities of us on land in terms of the impacts they have in water ecosystems. Because like I was saying the other day, we need to realize that the way the world is constructed by God, water is always on the lowest part, which means whatever activities we do and the, and the wastes they produce, if we don't manage these or treat them in the proper manner, eventually they end up in water ecosystems, compromising the health of these ecosystems. So I think the greening programs that we have, the control of, of, uh, of runoff, the control of soil erosion, the control of plastics so that they don't end up in these waters for us is very critical, including like now we have a, we have a new threat of the masks in these, you know, the face masks on these COVID and other paraphernalia related to COVID protocols and things like that. These, if not properly disposed and treated, will also cause a very big threat to the health of the marine ecosystems and the freshwater ecosystems through rivers and others. But also to say that uh, Kenya participates very seriously in the in the Indian Ocean activities. I know, for example, we have at the level of institutions and water view, we have the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association, which is very active. I know we participate in the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. In fact, the current president of uh, the Indian Tuna Commission is a Kenyan from this department. We participate in the South Southwestern Indian Ocean Fisheries Commission initiatives, including the initiatives of W and WWF. So we are very active in the Indian Ocean activities uh, moving forward uh, uh, on Vina. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I have a question from Cecilia Wandiga to the ambassador. Um, what specific blue economy activities do you envision as joint opportunities for Canada's first nation stroke indigenous people and rural Kenyan stroke East African communities? That is one. And then the second part, I wanted to check both before you answer. While both, this is from Dr. Collins Odote, he says that um, while both the PS and the ambassador correctly recognize that blue economy is both for ocean and other waters, there is undue focus on oceans and international fisheries. What specific policy measures is government taking to correct this skewed approach? I, I would like the ambassador to take that. The second one, I think that's true, that we can't forget the lakes. And we know that in Canada because we are the home of the Great Lakes system, which is five of the largest um, freshwater resources in the world. And so I look at Kenya and I look at Lake Victoria and the opportunities there are huge. And what it requires is extraordinary cooperation, um, cross-border cooperation. And it also requires an urgent, um, an, an urgent need to address the issue of water hyacinth which is taking over the lake. And I mentioned earlier that um, we are supporting TVETs across the country. And the TVET in um, Kisumu is really interesting. There's an element of applied research to, to the work that we're bringing to the TVETs to get the kids thinking about ways to take the knowledge and, and apply it in the real world. And one of the things they're doing is, is coming up with, their, they've created a machine. And if it goes according to plan, this machine will harvest water hyacinth from Lake Victoria and turn it into um, a usable fabric like hemp um, or burlap. And can you imagine the possibilities there? Because it's a free resource sitting there in Lake Victoria. So you've got job creation in creating these machines, job creation in getting people to do the harvesting, 
job creation and turning it into a usable fabric and job creation in that same TVET has a sewing facility as a sewing course, a seamstress course. So then you've got people designing garments to be made out of the hyacinth fabric and then selling them on the market. So I think that's one of the things that's really, really interesting and one of the reasons why we can't forget the links because they are a good resource. Um, on the first question, I didn't quite catch it. Were you asking about the connection between Canada's Indigenous people and Kenyans? Is that it? I think that is it. Uh, she's trying to ask uh, whether there is a connection in your uh, strategy uh, for Kenya and lessons that you can learn from perhaps the Inuit uh, communities and the rural local here in Kenya and East Africa. Is there some form of collaboration that can happen that can, tr can transfer lessons from that community in Canada to the, any of the Kenyan people? Yeah, I think, um, I think their answer is there should be. I'm not aware of any collaboration at this point in time, but certainly um, our Indigenous people are such an important uh, stakeholder in our management of our own um, uh, water resources. They know the fish, they know the land, um, and uh, certainly our, our Fisheries and Oceans Ministry works hand in hand with them. Um, sometimes a great relationship and sometimes it's a difficult relationship, a challenging relationship. But we can't discount that the value of that Indigenous knowledge uh, in terms of resource management in Canada is so important. And so I think there probably are lessons that can be learned. We're not quite there yet. Um, but I hope that when, uh, when the ministry's delegation gets cut to come back to Canada, um, as the PS rightly noted, we have planned to do this in April, but uh, COVID-19 had a different plan for us all. But when that uh, study tour can, can get back up and running, certainly you can't visit uh, the west coast of Canada, for example, and talk about fish without talking to indigenous communities. And so I think that will be the start of a very good conversation. Okay. Um, then I think uh, all the rest of the questions that are coming are going to the peers. I think, Mr. Pierce, you have a thousand and one questions. I just select a few uh, that you can check. This one is from Kanit Odongo, who says, What incentives are there in the Kenya government for the cage farmers in Lake Victoria? I have invested aquaculture farming and I am discouraged because of the cost of feeds. I have sunk over 20 million and I am unable to break even, let alone getting a return on my investment. And the government said that in cage farming, one needs a speed box for ease of access to the cages. These are very expensive locally, but when you try to import one from the US, the duty and taxes plus corruption at the port makes one feel very sad. How can we get assisted in that? Prof. You know, you know I, usually, I usually face these questions all the time. But to say this, you know, sometimes when I talk about Lake Victoria, I I sound discouraging, but uh, this is not meant to discourage. Uh, Lake Victoria, um, you know, like the ambassador has said, with a number of issues, including the water hyacinth. But also, we should look at all these problems of Lake Victoria coming from catchment activities. The population around that lake, it's called the heart of East Africa. Is so huge, the activities around that lake, the, the agriculture activities, the industrial activities in the developing towns and things like that. So I think we have to deal with catchment activities in that lake as a starting point. Remember there are two East African institutions meant to coordinate this mechanism for fisheries, there is the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization with the Secretariat in Jinja. Then uh, for the environment and other activities, there's the Lake Victoria Basin Commission with the Secretariat in Kisumu. So I think the thought by East Africa about Lake Victoria is very complete with this institution. In terms of uh, 
let me not talk about cage farming in the lake. We developed last year uh, with Treasury a raft of incentives for investors in blue economy. And we've just produced a handbook book explaining which incentives these are. Uh, uh, and you need to apply for these incentives through the direct, the, the, the direct and general for Kenya Fishery Service. I think you need to do that. I've seen a lot of people applying for those incentives, even those who are farming in Lake Victoria. So I encourage our, uh, my friend to apply for those incentives through the Direct General of the Kenya Fisheries Service. But um, Lake Victoria is an environment problem lake. And I think that's what we need to note. First of all, the residence time of water in that lake is so high. So any pollutants getting into that lake would mean there. For instance, it would mean there for a whole 11 years. This is why you find water ice and uh, colonizing that lake. In fact, from a research we did with the European Union uh, towards the end of 2000, the, the, the proposal was not to farm fish in that lake. But suddenly, because of you know the way things are, everybody is there farming. We need to ask ourselves: in a lake that is already over eutrophied with the nutrients, would farming activities not add more load to the nutrients in that lake? I think that's the question that we need to ask. But what we plan as Kenya is to demarcate certain areas for cage farming and not cages everywhere like it is now. It happened during that period of devolution where everybody rushed into the lake as though it was no man's land to farm. We will have a process of relocating these changes appropriately so that we can say we have these numbers and we stop at that because the lake is a, an environment problem lake with a lot of nutrients. And that's the problem for, for that lake. I think that's what I want to say on this. Okay, and then um, there's one question here, Prof, again, that is coming from two different persons. There is Edith Oguta in Kisumu and Andrew Arinaitwe in Uganda. Uh, I think they're all more or less wondering whether there is some framework for East African uh, community collaboration on the blue economy, if I may paraphrase uh, both questions. Do we have an arrangement that we bring together efforts by Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and perhaps even others, which are Rwanda, Burundi? I think I'd like to, ask, to answer that question from um, an African perspective. For example, coming from uh, from the conference in Nairobi in 2018. I think blue economy, it's not just for countries that have got um, shorelines and things like that. Even those who do not have shorelines are beneficiaries of the blue economy initiative in the continent and also in East Africa. For East Africa, Lake Victoria provides the best example of what collaboration that there can be I've indicated that um, we have two institutions dealing with blue economy issues for Lake Victoria, Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization with a secretariat in Ginger, and the Lake Victoria Business Commission with a secretariat in Kisumu, all reporting to the EAC in Arusha. Remember, although Rwanda and Burundi are not uh, part of Lake Victoria, they are in the basin. You remember I talked about basin activities in, in, these, in these waters. So the impact in one way or another, that they are, they are also beneficiaries of any transport systems that may be developed in, in that lake. They are also beneficiaries of fish caught in that lake. You see, Diva Kagela is the source of the cindrings that are coming to the lake to, 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 
you know, for, for, for the water I ascend. So you can see we are connected in one way or another. About the ocean is the same thing. We are connected in the fact that ports are part of blue economy issues in terms of trade and things like that, that, uh, that uh, ships uh, that transport the highest amount of uh, uh, trade goods, you know, all over the world. So I think we are connected in very many ways. And I think this is why we need to work together uh, all, all around. Okay, thank you. Now, um, because time is not on our side, I would like to uh, post just one common question uh, to all the panelists uh, as they wind up. Um, so one of them is the, what, what, where do you see uh, major knowledge gaps being uh, towards an inclusive and resilient blue economy so that researchers on this uh, audience can be able to pick up and run with? Where are the knowledge gaps? And secondly, uh, because there is the, the one key thing that emerged from that um, uh, Blue Economy Conference was the need for partnerships, both global, regional, national, and even cross-sector. So what, where do you see uh, the need to strengthen those in order for uh, those knowledge gaps that you identify to be uh, faster resolved? Let me begin with uh, Her Excellency Lisa. Thanks very much. I think um, one of the questions in the chat room kind of nailed it. <clears throat> if you've got three courses being offered by the university that are around ocean science and fisheries management that aren't being taken up by young people, that tells me that they're not understanding that these are potentially lucrative career opportunities. And so I think it really is a matter of continuing, you know, take that small scale workshop that we did and bring that to scale, really making an effort to educate young people in this country about the kinds of jobs that are available that we're not just talking about subsistence fishing, but we really are talking about um, some very exciting things. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a young Kenyan woman designer who is making clothing out of fish skin. Um, you know, the, the mind can expand with the opportunities that are available if you just open up, um, give people a taste of the kinds of things that we're talking about. It's not just fishing, it's transportation, it's tourism, it's wave science, it's ocean science, it's design, it's fashion, all of these wonderful things. Uh, so I think that really is the gap, is, is just uh, getting people to understand how large this field is, where some of the jobs lie, and what the skills path is to get there. Thanks. Prof? Professor Michele, please. You're muted. I'm going to unmute myself. I think, um, I think um, Dr. Ketui is that um, I mentioned a little earlier in this discussion that we need to embrace ocean and aquatic, uh, aquatic things literacy. And for me, ENGAP is not that uh, these courses are not in universities. Every university has got courses related to this. But to introduce this too late in our education system, we need to go back. If what we are seeing blue economy will do for the world, if what we are seeing the ocean, the ocean means to every human being on earth, I think we need to open up lower and include courses that will bring in young people to go to Tibet, to go to universities with the mind that I want to study this. To me, that's what I think is one of the biggest gaps which we need to fill moving forward. In terms of uh, partnerships, I think the divide between the developed world and uh, developing countries like ours in terms of uh, state of the knowledge, in terms of uh, innovations and technology. 
I think as we are going into the decade of uh, uh, ocean science, we need to see fully trusted partnerships. We need to see trusted partnerships between the developed world and the developing countries so that then we develop as one. I think we need to train appropriate so that we have manpower to those level to be able to do what we wish to do so that we can share knowledge, we can share data and the things like that. Thank you very much. Okay. And finally, Nancy? Yeah, thanks, Dr. I think uh, for me, what I see uh, as a knowledge gap, we say there is a lot of research that has been done, but it remains research. It remains research with scientists. And we see that big gap of translating it from science to policy, from a commitment to actioning it. Because there are so many commitments by our government, by the region, uh, in terms of uh, uh, conservation of the resources that we have, but we need to see that gap, you know, closing. So from science to policy, from commitment uh, to action. Uh, and I also see, um, I think uh, for Kenya and its commitment, now we are committed to what we call, in, we call the forest and land restoration. We want to restore. So I hope we do not get to a situation where we now have to start restoring the oceans. Uh, but rather, uh, you know, saving uh, the oceans uh, than moving to restoring them. And for the private sector, I think, which we mentioned, uh, so that uh, co coastal communities, communities along water bodies do not remain as artisanal, but we do need to close that, that gap where the private sector comes in and they're able to engage and communities have greater value uh, for the conservation they do and the work they do in these water bodies. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we are really uh, grateful that um, the panel has been able to articulate uh, the issues of the table quite uh, eloquently. Uh, we regret that uh, Cosmos was not able to join us from Abidjan. Uh, he, he may have had uh, connectivity issues. But nevertheless, I think we appreciate that the panel has been able to take this on uh, quite effectively. We've got uh, more than 30 questions pending, uh, which we couldn't share because of time. That simply shows the kind of interest that this uh, topic has created uh, in the populace. So I want to appreciate uh, the panelists once again, Professor Micheni, uh, Her Excellency Lisa Stadelbauer, and uh, Nancy for taking off your time to come and share uh, this knowledge that you have uh, with the uh, audience. We also want to appreciate uh, Edward Kimakwa, who has actually, we should have actually called him to be one of the panelists uh, from WWF. He's done a good job in answering some of the questions uh, on the chat. We do appreciate that. So once again, I want to thank all of you, the audience in general. We, you are too many for us to thank each of you. And we look forward to uh, sharing what comes out of this again uh, in form of a policy brief at our website uh, in, 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 in the next few days. Thank you very much and we look forward to talking with you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.